Hi everyone, my name is Jeremy. Um, uh, he, him pronouns. I am the director of the honors program. And um, I am so excited to welcome everyone here tonight um, for what is a sort of, as it were, November tradition um, here at SVA and at the honors program. Um, I don't know if we call it a Thanksgiving tradition or a uh, election day tradition, but we have with us um, really a guest I'm so honored to welcome. Um, I'll just say a little bit really quick about the Art and Politics Lecture Series. Um, the Art and Politics Lecture Series aims to think about um, the meaning of art in light of the serious crises that humanity faces in the present um, and to think about what uh, resources, what meaning, what um, sense we can make of where we stand in our moment in history and the delicate and complex filaments that tie um, the times and culture together. Um, so uh, we have, this is our last lecture of the semester. We have uh, more coming up in the, in the winter, spring, which I can say more about in a bit. But um, for now, I'll just start by welcoming um, our guest, Francis Fox Piven. Um, Francis Fox Piven is, uh, you know, uh, hard to describe um, all of her many accomplishments and virtues. Um, I'll just say uh, she is, you know, she has led the passage of a law, the Motor Voter Act. Um, if you are told when you get a driver's license that you have the right to register to vote, um, that is because of Francis Fox Piven. Um, and she is the author of many important volumes, including um, a favorite of mine, Poor People's Movements, um, another book, Challenging Authority, How Ordinary Americans Can Change the World. I'm actually forgetting totally the, um, <laughs> the subtitle. Um, uh, also, um, uh, Regulating the Poor, also Why Americans Don't Vote and Why Americans Still Don't Vote. Um, and why the powerful want to keep it that way. Um, also keeping down the black vote and many other important um, books about the relationship between, uh, basically the relationship between power and the structure of power and those who are trying to challenge it and change it, as well as the American uh, political and electoral system, how it channels dissent, how it channels um, frustration, and how occasionally um, voices that want to change it can break through uh, its strictures. Um, I should also note, as we put on uh, the promo, that um, she's also been referred to as one of the nine most dangerous um, people in the world by Glenn Beck, uh, infamously. So um, a human being of many accomplishments, um, a brilliant person, someone I'm um, glad to call a friend. Um, so, uh, oh, and I'll just say quickly also, finally, you know, um, we've talked a bunch about this uh, session. And when we talked about it over the summer, we talked about kind of the 1850s and the present. Also, when I wrote Francis recently asking like, what do you think you'll talk about? Um, I She put it extremely pithily, um, which I just felt I'd share, which is um, I'd like to talk about the growing distance between any reasonable definition of democracy and what we do here in the US. Um, so without further ado um, on that pithy um, brief note, um, let's all welcome Frances and I'll give the mic to her. Thank you, Fran. Thank you, Jeremy, for the introduction. And I'm glad to be here, glad to be speaking about the very important events that surround us and that will determine our future. Uh, this is an incredibly important and precarious moment in American political history. It's true that the election last Tuesday uh, went reasonably well. Things seem about the same as they were before the election. But meanwhile, many other facets of our politics are changing, are creaking, are splitting, are cracking. And it's very important that we try to understand that and understand why this is happening in the United States of America. The, I think that I would like to begin talking about what's going on by talking about, first about the sort of the basic elements of democracy. If 
we are to have a democracy, what has to be true? What conditions have to prevail? Democracy, I think, refers to the relationship between the mass of the citizenry and those who hold government office. And because they hold government office can determine what the state will do. And the classical definition of democracy gives the mass of the citizenry, not the ability to determine everything that the appointees of the state do, but the ability at least to determine whether they can continue to hold office or not. And that ability is measured at periodic elections. The Those periodic elections uh, are conducted in what is sometimes considered a kind of separate sphere from society. At elections, we are all, all those who are citizens at least, are in a certain sense equal. In the larger society, there are vast inequalities and irregular inequalities that are not necessarily predictable. But in the electoral sphere, everybody has a vote. Those votes are counted. And the tally of the count determines whether or not the reigning regime can continue to hold office. Well, that doesn't work very well. And in fact, it has never worked very well. But it's important to understand the ways in which it is changing the democratic sphere. This It's in a sense an artificial sphere in which everybody is equal. Everybody has one vote. Those votes are all counted. And the count determines who reigns, who rules. Uh, but even with the, within that artificial sphere that we have created, and it's an accomplishment, I think, to create even an artificial sphere in which people are equal. In that sphere, there are many uh, distortions. For many limits, on equality that are embedded in our constitution. For example, we have different offices that control the powers of the federal government. Some of those offices are called senators. Senators are actually very, the Senate is a very unequal institution because every state has two senators, but every state has different numbers of people. So that the numerous people of California are represented with the same number of senators as the not very numerous people of Montana or Idaho, for example. Moreover, the inequalities that are rooted in the Senate also extend to the Electoral College, which derives its powers from the Senate. Then also there are the courts. You've been hearing a lot about the courts lately, the Supreme Court especially, and the corruption that seems to be embedded in the court or in the justices that are, constitute the court. The court is not elected. Moreover, these justices are appointed for life and they have enormous power. For a very long time, working people in the United States were stymied in their effort to derive, to, to accumulate the protections and power afforded by unions. They were stymied in doing this by rulings of the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court continues to have extraordinary power, but it's an unelected body. Well, 
so even in this protected sphere that is electoral representative democracy, there are extraordinary distortions and limits on the equality, political equality of the citizens who are included in this democracy. Moreover, and this is important, the sphere of electoral representative democracy is penetrated in, on all sides by the inequalities of the larger society. Think of electoral representative democracy as in a way an invention. It wasn't an invention. It was an invention by the Chartists in uh, England. And it was a brilliant in invention. How to create a sphere in which people could be equal in a very unequal society. Well, they tried to do this, but what they did was deeply imperfect. However, the imperfections were deepened by the fact that what goes on in the larger society penetrates the insulated sphere of electoral representative democracy. The inequalities of the larger society are very erode, constantly erode the equality that is sometimes fashioned by electoral representative institutions. For example, we talk a lot about the influence of money on elections. And we're right to talk a lot about the influence of money on elections because money can buy advertising that influences voters. Money can buy the representatives that the voters elect. Money, money is very attractive, isn't it? Or, or think and the influence of money in turn has to do with the ways in which electoral representative equalities are distorted, eroded by those who are elected. Think, think for example, of what's happening in the United States now and what has been happening in the United States for the last 10 years or so. We have an imperfect, but nevertheless, we have a democracy. In that democracy, everybody has, or most people have the right to vote. But we know from surveys and polls that that those voters are not going to don't like a lot of the policies that are being promoted by reigning politicians. There's therefore a problem, and that problem is solved by distorting the electoral representative mechanism itself. For example, dollars can be used to advertise positions. Those who are in power can gerrymander districts, the districts which enclose a given number of voters who determine the representative. Uh, gerrymandering has become very radical and very widespread in the United States. All districts, or almost all districts, are gerrymandered these days. Uh, or think about the obstacle course that can be manipulated by those who are presumably temporarily in control of the state. They That, that, that obstacle course determines whether the right to vote can be actualized. So, for example, we have a system called voter registration. Voter registration can be easy. It's a system simply of collecting the data on who's eligible to vote. It can be easy or it can be made incredibly difficult. And 
as those who are in power, who are elected, who hold office, as these incumbents find themselves more and more distant from the preferences of the electorate, of the citizenry, they can not only gerrymander districts, but also make it more and more difficult for people to actually exercise the right to vote. So that if you look at the whole course of American history, we have a curious pattern gradually over the hundreds of years in which we've been an electoral representative democracy, more and more of the citizenry has been granted the right to vote. But because of the obstacle course that can then be created, interfering with the exercise of that right, the proportion of people that actually vote has not changed at all. So, and then there's the, the uh, another very big problem that has to do with the distance between practical, the practical exercise of democracy and what actually, and, and the ideal of democracy. And that big problem has to do with what the voters are supposed to do. The voters are supposed to vote for those candidates who promise to deliver the policies that will make voters better off, more comfortable, that will endorse their preferences, their symbolic preferences, their cultural biases. That's what, that's what the whole idea is supposed to be about. People look around, they see if things are going the way they like it. If they do, if they are, they'll vote for them. Well, I've already referred to some of the interferences uh, between that process and the actual voting process, but there is also the problem of trying to understand what policies are producing the conditions which make me poor or make me uncomfortable or force me to move or have destroyed the industry for which I work or endanger me with fracking? What policies? It's very, very complicated. How do you understand those policies? Moreover, politicians don't want you to understand because that will interfere, inhibit your voting for them at the next election. Uh, I recall a rally that Donald Trump conducted in Michigan before the last election in which he appe appealed to the gathered throng by saying, aren't you happy at all the automobile plants I brought to Michigan? The crowd roared its approval. He had not brought any automobile plants to Michigan. But how do you figure that out? It's not easy. And then there are what you might call the new problems that have emerged that are registered mainly by pundits who talk about the dangers of fascism in the United States. Those new problems have to do with a number of changes that are taking place in this very complicated process of political campaigns. One, one change has to do with what Benny Thompson, the congressman, uh, referred to as the attempted coup of January 6th, where 
masses of people were encouraged to march on the capital of the United States and interrupt or stop the counting of the vote. That's very irregular. It's not how the process is supposed to work. Another change has to do with uh, something I have really just begun to think about. And that is a kind of transformation of the political campaign process from a campaign about policies. Aren't you happy that we, and this did happen, we have uh, reduced unemployment, not we, the Biden administration has reduced unemployment to a 50 year low. And the Biden administration has also uh, presided over the policies which have led to increased wages. But it isn't clear that people even know that. In fact, it does seem that they don't know it. And that's because politics, political campaigning is no longer about policies, even simplified versions of policies, maybe even distorted versions of policies. It's not about policies anymore. It's about a kind of entertainment, a kind of, it's about propaganda. It's about people getting up in front of crowds and going, oh, you know, all the things that Donald Trump does. It's about cruelty. It's about, what is it that Donald Trump said in one of his recent, I saved this. He said this on his social network, that he will root out the communists, Marxists, fascists, and radical left thugs that live like vermin. Now, the pundits who commented on that pointed out that that was a kind of metaphor, vermin, that was used by the Nazis. But what I, and that's true, uh, but what strikes me about it is the flamboyance of the language, the evocative uh, and cruel character of the metaphor, that is metaphors that are being used. Moreover, it's not just language. It's also the case that the, the Trump clique is planning to cancel civil service protections for large swaths of federal workers and replace them with MAGA ad adherents. Uh, that's a plan. And the plan is a fascist plan. So we have a lot to wor worry about. Now, over the last next couple of years, we don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen, and you don't either. Jeremy? Want me to jump in? Sure. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen either. So, um, uh, yeah, so our thought was that... Um, I have a couple of thoughts for Francis, and then we can um, uh, we can kind of bat it back to the uh, to the whole group for some questions. Thank you so much for laying out some of the profound distorting mechanisms um, that fail to translate popular will into policy. Um, I think those people in this group who are my students will be familiar with some of these. Um, I guess. Well, so. A couple questions. One is just maybe on the tip of my tongue is like, what do you think about the New York Times poll that everyone was talking about? The one that shows Biden in quite a lot of danger in the swing states. Um, is that 
an outlier? Is that the, um, you know, has something shifted in the last month that is significant for the electoral results? Um, what does that mean for the rest of us uh, who basically only have a choice between two candidates in this election? Um, I am curious about your thoughts that, on that and a few other points. I'd be I don't think we know what it means. Uh, but look, merely to pose the question is to reveal, I think, one of the quandaries created by the development of electoral politics in the United States. Biden has done pretty much everything that someone versed in the traditional idea of how electoral democracy should work would say that he should do. He's done the thing. He's done what you should do. He's been an FDR of the 21st century. Uh, he's pr promoted the policies which have reduced unemployment, raised wages, and protected vulnerable people. He's done all that. But it's not at all clear that people know he's done all that. And that's because policies, are, the model doesn't work the way it's supposed to because people can't understand the connection between complex policies and their own living conditions. It's impossible to connect the two at least without a big apparatus of propagandists. Uh, so people look at Biden and they say, oh, he's old. And yeah, he is old, but what has that got to do with it? If, if your wages are up, if unemployment is down, if the poor are getting benefits and health care, why is everybody talking about the fact that he seems feeble? How does that affect you? It's crazy. Yeah, I mean, I wonder, partly, I think the FDR, the thing maybe none of us talked enough about um, over the last few years is one aspect of that administration, relevant to people in this Zoom room especially, maybe, is that, you know, FDR also had a, a strong sense of sort of publicity and of interacting with ordinary people, whether it was the fireside chats or even, you know, some of the projects like the WPA type projects, which obviously were partly um, a works progress administration for people here who don't know, was which were direct hiring of artists to do public murals, to do, um, uh, uh, to beautify cities and buildings. Um, many abstract expressionists got their start from working for the government. I mean, uh, theaters, musicians, et cetera. One, you know, obviously that was like an unemployment program in part, and it was the Great Depression. You needed lots of unemployment programs, but arguably also an effect it has which was just like, it made very visible um, very quickly certain kinds of like New Deal projects and ideas and, you know, all those posters we still remember to this day or, the Civilian Conservation Corps digging paths. And I remember actually early in the Biden administration, there was some debate um, on the environmental bill about activists really, really wanting a new Civilian Conservation Corps, basically wanting some sort of jobs program that would create very visible kind of parks and um, natural things that would touch people's lives in an immediate way. And that you know, I, I think for wonkish reasons and also for political reasons, people were like, eh, that's not going to change so much. You know, we're going to do this big subsidy program. It's going to build all these solar reactors. It's the most spending on the environment in any country anywhere. Um, uh, but I, you know, I feel like it failed to, to touch people's lives. Um, and, you know, maybe I'm just saying the same thing you just said, but I've, I've thought some about this. Well, I think that it's true that FDR and him, FDR himself, he was a very personable guy. FDR's fireside chats. Do you remember reading about that? Uh, 
I think from what my reading, uh, those fireside chats really did. Everybody had a radio, uh, no TV, but they had a radio. And FDR's drawl uh, came into the living rooms of a lot of Americans. Moreover, there was not the kind of competitive propaganda that the Biden administration confronts. Everybody else, or, or the right wing is interpreting what Biden is doing even before he does it, even before the Democrats in the House of Representatives do it. There's constant, constant interpretation. And I find it just amazing that people seem unable to even recognize their own circumstances. Are they better off or not better off? I think that's very, very weird, very, very uh, out of touch, beyond the realm of the conventional way of thinking about how democracy works, that people assess their own circumstances, they decide whether they're better off or worse off with this gang of politicians. And if they're worse off, they're going to kick them out of power, kick them out of office. Uh, but how do they even figure out if they're better off? That is so strange. Yeah, I mean, the only, again, the maybe rationalist in me wants to say the other thought I've had is that these years have been like highly unstable. So on the one hand, like the job market is doing much better, but people are still coming out of like, a horrible pandemic, um, inflation and high interest rates, though, you know, they could have been much worse and a little inflation for such low jobs, um, such low unemployment rate is uh, worth doing. Um, it did maybe add to just a sense of like, things are out of control. I, you know, where are things heading? I don't understand it. There's wars abroad. You know, I do think this just sense that like, things are in a state of chaos. I mean, certainly, I don't think that was any less true under Trump, but I do think that has persisted. And there is a sense just like people are frightened and overwhelmed. That's like one other thought I've had as to explaining. I think you're right. But I, and, and I would even sort of expand it. It's not only the politics of the federal government that has become uncertain and maybe even scary. But we've been through a pandemic and plagues. I mean, plagues have always terrified people, rightly so. And so we have the, the COVID plagues and then the dangers of global warming. And these are no longer just inform people warning uh, mass publics. People can see the wildfires caused by, and, and the effect of wildfires on the air we breathe, or they can see the devastation caused by flooding. And, it's a very scary moment for reasons that go beyond immediate government policies. It may be the case that government can help us weather those crises, but that's another that that's sort of another phase, another it, it's a little bit of a longer term perspective. But it's a scary time. And I think that. The, the alarm that people feel about the uncertainty of the natural world and the uncertainty of the political world is here for the time being at least. And it's very dangerous because people do turn to strongmen when they feel that kind of uncertainty. And I should say that I don't think the strong men are actually strong. I don't think Trump is a strong political leader. I think he is 
a vainglorious, narcissistic uh, parasite on the system. Um, I'll ask one last thing and then let's just open up to questions um, generally and let's all have a discussion. Um, I was just wondering, going back a little bit to the presentation overall, like what you were describing about the way in which, I mean, I love what you said about the um, uh, uh, the invention that is the democratic political sphere. Um, I think that's really a profound and interesting way to think about it and to put it. Um, and I wonder just, you know, there have obviously been um, waves in American history of moments where people tried to make democratic living more a reality. Um, you mentioned the kind of expansion of the suffrage um, pursued by, you know, um, Black people in Reconstruction or in the Civil Rights Movement. Um, you mentioned, you know, uh, we can talk about women's suffrage. We can talk about, you know, um, uh, the populist movement and attempts to pull back some of the power of the wealthy. So there have been uh, these moments in American history. It does often, it does also seem though that some of the obstacles you're describing are quite sort of deep and baked in the system. Um, I mean, I think part of the puzzlement about what to do about the Supreme Court right now is just like, it seems really quite hard to change. The Electoral College, really quite hard to change. And though there have been a lot of movements, and actually I think many of the movements in the last few years have spoken in the language of democracy and increasing democracy, wanting democracy from um, the actual changes in our electoral representative arrangements. Have, I can't think of many actually. So I'm curious like what you see as the, you know, um, what you see as some of the, the possibilities or in, in moments where there are such successful changes, what are some things we can learn from those moments? Well, I think that the, the electorate has been expanded. Uh, those were big reforms and they were reforms that were motored by social movements. Uh, the tricky part has to do with what happens after the formal enfranchisement of black people, for example, as a result of the Voting Rights and Civil Rights Act. Well, what happens is that those politicians who are disadvantaged by that reform work incessantly to introduce the obstacles which procedurally disenfranchise the people who have won the franchise. That's what has been happening in the United States. There are laws that have been introduced in most of the states that make it harder to vote for those who won the franchise over the last 40 or 50 years. And those are contested to be sure, but they have to you have to fight the fight again and again and again. And we're going to have to fight the fight again and again uh, for any other, for, for, for example, oh, the youth vote. This is a very important struggle that is just emerging, I think. Young people lean left in American politics. They're more, much more likely to vote Democratic. And the Republican Party, it's still called a party, although it acts more like a mafia. Uh, the Republican Party is going to try to disenfranchise young people. And it's going to try to do it procedurally because there's no basis, constitutional basis, for disenfranchising them by law. And that's that's going to be a big fight if we live to fight it. Um, 
well, here's to fights that we live to fight. Um, I uh, think we should open up the discussion more broadly. Um, Ingrid, I see you in the chat. Do you want to speak to your question um, and get us started? After Ingrid, um, please feel free to put just um, the word stack in the chat or to raise your hand via emoji. And uh, I'll call on you and let's uh, let's have some discussion. So Ingrid, do you want to jump in? Yes, uh, Francis, you said that um, even though Biden is doing a lot of things right, uh, most people, including most Democrats, don't really know. And it uh, it seems to me that certainly in my lifetime, the Republicans were always better at advertising their lines. They always had the better catch lines. I mean, I'm just thinking of, for instance, the, um, uh, you know, in, in the abortion debate, um, uh, th there was nothing that the Democrats could offer as a good counter line. Um, why, why is it that in spite of the fact that so many artists and young people sympathize naturally with the platform of the Democrats, that, that we are so, so really bad at putting this out in a way that that echoes in the same way as those terrible Trump pronouncements do. What's your thought on that? Well, I'm not sure that that's true. I'm not sure. I'm not mm. saying I disagree. I'm not sure. Mm. Uh, I think that a lot of the boldness and flamboyance of the Republican public face is owed to the fact that they have the MAGA movement. The MAGA movement doesn't have many of the characteristics that I usually think of as associated with movements. What are their grievances? Their grievances seem to have to do with immigrants. Uh, displacing them or get, pushing ahead of them in line, as they would say. Uh, but the Democrats have had movements too. Uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, for example. I don't know, what do other people think about that question? Is, is it, is this dilemma that we're discussing the result of the expertise or talents of the Republicans or the Republican right wing versus the Democrats? Or is it the result of something else? What do people think? Nobody thinks. <laughs> what do you think, Jeremy? I wanna jump in? Yeah. I have infinite thoughts, but. <laughs> I mean, I think it's got to be some combination of both. <laughs> um, I do think uh, it has to do possibly with like the increased entry of new actors into politics and the um, both parties being sort of flummoxed by uh, the decline of a previous period, which was very low participation, um, and now a more high participation period, and that confusing a lot of categories. Um, and so, and the right and the left, like Trump being very, very good at taking advantage of the new people on the right being brought into politics. And then maybe in the Democratic Party, there being a lot less clarity on how to do that. Um, that's like one immediate thought as to what's going on more broadly? Hard for me to imagine Trump being so experienced or talented as to be able to take advantage of political circumstances in contrast to democratic politicians. I mean, Trump, well, you know what Trump is. Uh, He's certainly not an expert at politics or political campaigning or political duplicity. Uh, 
I think he's an accident that has arrived for the right to use. And he has done some nice things for his constituents. I don't mean MAGA people. I mean big money people. Nobody's going to talk because I'm sounding so gloomy. Don't let me get away with that. <laughs> People should jump in line. Uh, stack is open. Questions, thoughts, please jump in. What should we do? You tell me, because you're younger than I am, so you must have a vision for the future that I don't have. Um, so I see Christine on stack and then Tom. Go ahead, Christine. Yeah, I, I'm getting back to the to the last question about propaganda and so on. I immediately thought about the role of the media and um, how years ago, Perhaps I was naive, but years ago, I used to uh, depend on the New York Times to tell me what was happening in the world and to report on things in a lengthy and well thought out and objective manner. And now it, uh, I sometimes feel that they're they're giving Trump free publicity because he because something sensational happened. Um let alone the news outlets that are already trying to be sensational and not give you all the news that's presumably fit to print. So um, uh, does, doesn't that distort what we can talk about and what we can think about? Well, there's not only uh, the New York Times uh, versus the tabloids, but there's also social media. And I have to admit that I don't know enough about social media to be able to say how, how that interferes with our politics. Who does? Does anybody here track social media? Jeremy, do you? I mean, I have scattered thoughts and some things I've read, but I am not actually on social media for reasons of sanity. So <laughs> trying to maintain mine. But it, it has to be important because people place so much importance on, on it. And I don't know. I'm, I'm not, I'm just not versed in it. I'm not part of that world. Isn't somebody here part of that world? I mean, certainly I think social media has played a key role in, you know, decentering traditional um, news sources. And there are some very positive things about that because traditional news sources um, have been, you know, at times like quite uh, uh, selective about what they choose to report, how they choose to report it. Um, and on the other hand, um, social media also clearly relies on a model of like stoking anger, of uh, producing, you know, massive, uh, intense hatreds at all times, um, which certainly increases polarization, loyalty of one side to another, lack of thinking. I mean, those are some of like the immediate thoughts I have on that. Well, I can't comment on it because I don't know, but do any of you? Who is on social media? Um, I found that social media creates an environment where there's a lot of, it's really easy to get information, but a lot of the information is inaccurate or um, misleading. Like Jeremy said, especially like just a recent example with the conflict in Israel. Um, it's really encouraged to take um, a side, take a side on the binary rather than um, like explore the nuanced uh, aspects of, you know, the entire conflict and 
it's it's much more preferable on social media to be able to have the narrative of like uh, good versus bad when a lot of the time it's really uh, just so much more complicated than that. I can also uh, speak about it a bit. Um, my, like, I'm a student, but I worked professionally for a few years as an illustrator uh, at a tech comp- a tech media website. Uh, and a lot of what we covered was these social media companies and um, and what immense power they hold over uh, all media across the world and the minds of people across the world. And so like, and they are only, they're really no better than you and I, they're all made of people. And there's so many um, things that can go wrong there and they, didn't, they don't know the power they hold. Uh, so when you know, 2016's election happened, uh, everybody, they didn't know what to do about it. Um, and they didn't know what to do about the misinformation that was uh, happening and, and like so much of what, what happens online in terms of algorithmic uh, surfacing of content is, is unknown to even the creators who make those things um, and, and how they function and what they are, end up doing is really only understood after the fact. Um, and I remember some of the, some of the key, uh, some of the surprising stuff that really took me, that really showed me how powerful these tools are is, it was not American related, but uh, Facebook's, um, issues in, I think it was Myanmar, of these other countries where um, their only way of communicating is through these platforms and how there's just an insane amount of information that gets spread, uh, misinformation that gets spread very rapidly between closed groups of, of, of um, messaging and how that could lead to riots and that can lead to uh, innocent people getting killed uh, by, my, by mob justice. Uh, and And there are just these task forces in these companies that are are trying to do something about it. But um, and another thing was how Facebook gets to play God in a way that like they get to divert their resources or their server capacity or their people resources towards specific countries who might need attention or who might not, who they considered might not need atten- attention. So there's just a lot of power in these companies. Um, and and we're really just kind of building the boat or building the plan as we fly it. Um, it's, and it's just, an, it's really fascinating. What I really loved about that job is, is, is reading these articles. Um, and it's just in, in awe inspiring how a flip of a switch in one way or a connection of a server in another way can just have these devastate, devastating uh, and cascading effects across society and the mental health of mental health of people uh and and just countries that the the result of elections and, and the direction of countries and all that stuff so that's kind of what i've understood about it all um and uh what i what i think about it so is it fair to say that what you're describing is power on a roll without a master Without somebody wielding the power with a goal, uh, I in some ways, yeah, I, I think I mean, that's like, like you know, Zuckerberg and uh, these these tech CEOs. I think might be the ones theoretically wielding it. I think you know, it, it, and it's always frustrating how slow the government is to understand these technologies. We're seeing this again with AI, uh, and, and how slow they are to regulate things. Um, and and all those hearings before like in the past few years with Google and Facebook, where we're trying to understand what happens with these like election interferences and stuff. Um, yeah, I think that's a fair thing to say. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I, I I want more regulation across those across that industry and all those companies, and I think, but it takes a, a knowledgeable government to to effectively do it. Um, cause all the, all the tech is changing so rapidly all the time. But, yeah. I mean, we, may, maybe you could say that the CEOs <laughs> hold that power, unfortunately. Well, that's very weird. Power yeah. on a roll without a mission, without a goal. Yeah. And they, I think that's, um, 
exemplified also with Twitter and Elon Musk buying it and this transition there, where Twitter before was very, it, it took its role as a, um, as a public square very seriously, but also was very playing very nicely with government uh, and like regulatory bodies and, and news organizations and making all these partnerships and um, having teams dedicated to, to uh, correct information and stuff like that. And now when Musk buys it, I think you could say that he's probably the one with the most, the CEO of a social media company has the most, there's not CEO, he's the owner, uh, with the most of a goal, I think, which is to go the opposite way and not have any of those restrictions or, or, or safety measures, uh, which is very dangerous. And unfortunately, that's the, that's, I think the most power being well, uh, wielded in social media with the most of a direction and most of a goal, but I think it, in the opposite way, unfortunately. Well, that's still very different from, in a way, the conventional view of the enemy, the conventional view of at least the liberal left of the enemy is it's the enemy is rooted in the economy and money and co corporate power. Mm. And what does that have to do with what you're identifying as the power wielders? I mean, isn't it something like, and then maybe we can jump back on stack too, but I think, um, I think Alex, what you're describing is fascinating. Isn't it though, you know, if we think about, I mean, maybe one other thing to add to your list from the beginning, Francis, was like um, democracy. Another part of the issue of mistranslation of like popular will to policy is precisely, I mean, as many democratic theorists have recognized with no adequate sources of democracy, uh, sorry, no adequate sources of information and public knowledge, um, it's impossible for people to govern themselves because they don't know what's happening. Um, and in the United States, it's sometimes not so much, I mean, I think this is true of traditional mass media as well as new media. Um, it's not so much always, I mean, sometimes there's like an intention, you know, an intentional attempt to mislead the public on XYZ issue. But oftentimes it's just that the, the keys to the kingdom of these massively powerful tools are not entrusted with a direction or with kind of a clear public purpose. And so they have a clear public function. I mean, television has a clear public function. Social media has a clear public function. They play a role in our public sphere, but they don't actually, no one is requiring the people who have control over them to exercise the public function in any particular way that's democracy enhancing. Um, in fact, you know, they're heads of corporations. They are legally required to maximize shareholder value as their um, main uh, uh, orientation. So it, in that sense, it seems to me kind of similar in a way that like some of the issues with media in the US um, for a long time have been less about, you know, um, the intentional use by powerful people to mislead the public. Though again, it happens, um, certainly. Uh, uh, COINTELPRO or, you know, we can think of examples, but like oftentimes it's much more just that like no one's minding the store of these like super, super important um, mechanisms of the public sphere. Well, except that when it comes to the main financial sources of support for the media companies, which are in their advertising, uh, you know that they're going to protect those. So that, I mean, you could analyze it. There's something to grab hold of and somewhere to point the finger of blame, somewhere to attack. That's very important to know who the enemy is and to have an enemy. I, the last thing I uh, say on it, uh, so everybody else can uh, continue the conversation, is I think uh, in similar functions, uh, social media is is built on advertising, um, 
but also in the mass data collection and, uh, and, and privacy um, overstepping and, this, and the, the amount of data that they gather on everybody. Uh, and then, so part of it is that, that we somebody's already mentioned um, is the incentivization, the incentivize, uh, you know, watch time and, and time spent on the apps. And then they guide people through uh, echo chambers of content and they further radicalize people because they're incentivized to give people the same thing that they want over and over again. Uh, so they could get more money off their um, ads and also their data. And then I, I think some of the some of the regulations around data privacy um, and, and restricting how much they can gather about about a single person. And um, I think that is a way to attack their power. Um, and there are some laws that I've I, I forget exactly what they were, but there are some recent uh, and in where they were. I think it might be in the Europe. Uh, or here, but there are a few laws that can drastically damage Facebook's, for example, um, advertising business model, uh, because so much of what they do is based on the data that they collect and how they can leverage that against advertising and more strategic, uh, smarter advertising. Um, and once you cut that faucet, uh, once you cut that uh, that tube of, uh, of data collection, then they have so much less to work with and uh, so much of their value of the, of the company tanks. So I, I think those are some of the ways you could attack it. Um, and also I think data privacy and security in general is, is a worthy cause, uh, let alone like it being uh, damaging to Facebook's bottom line. I think those are some of the routes that those things can be uh, managed or attacked. <laughs> yeah. Well, doesn't data privacy have to do with creating vast markets for your product? Isn't that where it where it becomes an issue for these actors? Uh, well, I'm not. I'm not sure. Selling the lists. So I think what Alex is referring to, Francis, is like, um, you know, what draws people's attention, who's attending to what. Um, is data can be turned into numbers, which can be sold to advertisers. Advertisers can then target really precisely. Well, that's what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. I'm talking about, I mean, the sort of commercial uses of this data. That's why it's valuable, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Is it? What else? No, I, mean, I think that's the main, the main, the main function of it, for sure, uh, to be leveraged internally by, I mean, every company uh, that has a privacy policy is going to, is, is usually collecting data of some sort. Um, and they can use that internally, like Facebook uses internally and captures internally, but also Facebook and companies like, I, recently I read like 23andMe, these are like DNA uh, sequencing companies can then, can use it internally and then you can also market it out and sell it to other people for other use, uh, anonymize the data and then sell it out. So Facebook is their internal ad platforms and how they make money use, utilizes that data, uh, but they can also purchase and, and sell that data uh, if they wanted to. Uh, so yeah, it's like, it can be just used, data in itself can be sold and, and, and manipulated and, and passed uh, back and forth. There's a great piece I sometimes um, have read with students from the London Review of Books a couple of years ago, I think, maybe three or four years ago called You Are the Product. The basic idea being that with, especially with social media and internet services, if you're getting it for free, then you're what's being sold. Um, you, uh, It's not being, you're not the target actually, you are the um, commodity that is being sold to an advertiser to whatever. We are all the commodities in this advertising model of what it is that they're trading. Ah. <laughs> um, I saw Lee was on stack um, to ask about disinformation. Lee, do you want to jump in? Hi, yeah, I, I I got here late because I couldn't get onto the Zoom, so I'm not sure where we started. But And a lot of what we've just been talking about covers it. But I mean, I, it just seems to me that half the populace doesn't have any of the kind of factual information that they might need to make an educated vote. 
and um, and I think we're covering that with the idea of social media. I also think it's, I mean, you know what I think, Jeremy, I think it's like the capitalism and <laughs> and answering to the, to the shareholders rather than at any larger responsibility. But I feel like we may have covered some of that since I posted it. Well, if you have anything else to say, I, I, I would love to hear it. And there's a question to my, in my mind about whether the MAGA base of this I mean, there is a fascist movement in the United States. Yes, there is. And its base is MAGA. Uh, I, I think that the role of our traditional enemies, I'm speaking as a lefty now, the role of our traditional enemies in this is not central. Uh, and but it wasn't central in Nazi Germany either. The role of the car German cartels in the rise of Hitler was not central. They permitted it, but they didn't do it. They weren't the main actors. And I don't think that the biggest businesses are the main actors in the Trump campaign either. So what do we do about that? <laughs> Well, we, I think the, I think we have to try to make the most of our, the advantages that we gain as a result of democratic institutions. Uh, that, that means, for example, we have to work in elect, on electoral politics. I think the left is doing that. And I think that the relatively favorable election results last week are the result of that effort. Uh, I think we have to do more of that. I think we have to do grassroots politics. What else is there? But then but then we're only talking to the left, right? The, the right is not listening to any of that. And the the right will not convince the right. I don't think we will. Do you? I... I, I'm I'm mixed, and I'm also worried that the that many of the youth, who many of whom are on here tonight, are disenfranchised. You know that they're they're not going to vote. Who's not going to vote? People on the left. We'll say people no, on, the young younger people on the left are really not going to vote in large numbers uh, for 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 who we're proposing this time around. Yeah, I would say just to look back at Tuesday, there is the like Ohio and Kentucky. Yeah. I mean, basically wherever. Wherever abortion proposals have been put up for popular votes, they've been doing quite well. And that, to me, is like a hopeful thing, actually, about what's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they also yeah. increase turnout, but we don't have good data on that yet. But we will. We will. I think it will increase turnout. I, I think that there are a lot of sort of simmering right to vote issues in the states because the right, the Republicans basically, have been active in state politics at vote suppression. There are a lot of new vote suppression laws, a lot of which have not yet been passed. They haven't made their way through the state legislatures. They could become the focus of organizing and conflict as well well i hope i hope you're right <laughs> well, i mean abortion may abortion may be the maybe maybe the issue that cuts across the board quite a bit we'll see but it's also the re revival of the labor movement why don't we think that's important i do yeah the uaw the theater unions there's a lot of activism there and Black Lives Matter was a movement, was probably the biggest movement we've seen in a long time. It was, it didn't have much of an action agenda, uh, but it was a movement nevertheless. Yeah. I mean, I do think with Lee that like there's, you know, I mean, I agree with you, Francis, that there's a core of, you know, motivated 
say MAGA activists who you're never going to reach, that doesn't mean there's not like a wider periphery of people who are maybe attracted in certain ways that like could potentially be reached. And there's a lot of like, you know, I think, I mean, and the other side is clearly trying to do that. I mean, one of the crazy things about that recent New York Times poll, and we'll see how accurate it was, but was showing like major shifts among black voters in key swing states to considering Trump. Now, again, that makes me think maybe that's an outlier. You know, there's like strong reasons that black voters are pretty attached to the Democratic Party in this country. But also there is like, you know, an active attempt in at least some parts of the far right to think about how can we, you know, pull off parts of the Democratic coalition, um, like chunks of Hispanic and Black voters who may lean socially conservative, um, but are economically liberal so far. Similar, I think the left should be having those conversations and thinking those thoughts about, you know, chunks of highly suffering white working class voters in um, the Midwest living in small towns where suicide rates are going through the roof or whatever. We can think about who those chunks of um, parts of the base of the right that we might want to try to pull over are. Um, but I think that's like, you know, I do agree with Lee that that's important to think about when we're thinking about national politics. Yeah, I just think there's a whole body of people out there that aren't getting any of this information, it's not relevant to them, um, that we're listening to different things. And that that's dif disinformation as well, right? Well, uh, who are they? Are they the Black voters who have shifted? Or do you think? Well, I, the, the only personal experience I have with these people is I know a group of, of very right-wing evangelical Christians in Oregon. And, and and I have a very cordial relationship with them, but I also understand that what the news that they're hearing has nothing to do with, with my experience of what's going on in the world. And their interpretation of it is completely different. Um, they're, they're, not getting, they're not getting any of the same information. It's, it's um, different sources, different ideas about what it's about. Well, but I don't, I think that the only probably the most likely way of communicating with people who don't have what we think is good information is through movement action, movements. I don't know what other vehicle we have. Okay. We, we, can't, we don't have propaganda apparatuses. It's the movement that sometimes communicates a dissident message that reaches people. So, okay. <laughs> thank you. I, I know I agree with you. I mean, I'm on your team, but um, I I hope you're right. <laughs> um, I see Ingrid's hand. Um, we're coming up close to time, so I certainly invite any more students who want to jump in too. Um, please uh, raise your hand, get on stack, um, or just jump in. Um, hand it to Ingrid. Francis, you asked before. You said, "What about the young people? Is anybody optimistic?" I'm certainly not young, but I I am optimistic. Okay. And I say, and I say that <laughs> I say that because I'm looking at conflicts in the past. For instance, if anybody remembers the North Island problem, right? Where where there were people, Catholics and Protestants shooting each other on sight on the streets of Dublin. And I'm old enough to remember the news about that. Nobody had any idea how this could possibly ever end without, you know, everybody lying dead in the streets, right? Now, I don't know how many decades have passed, but they don't do that anymore. And I, I challenge anyone to explain how that happened. Maybe people just got sick and tired of shooting each other on sight on the street. I don't know. But but I am hoping uh, that the same mysterious process will set in in Ukraine and in Israel. And um, that's really the only chance we have. And I think one way of getting there, not to criticize you because you know everything much better than I do. But I think um, 
to facilitate this process that has happened in Northern Ireland, what we need is not to look at the other people as the enemy, but as fellow humans who, when it comes down to it, want the same thing we want, right? And so there we go. That's my contribution. Now I shut up. Let the young people speak. <laughs> well, I think that that is how we should approach the antagonist or the competitor or the enemy. We should assume that they want the same things that we want. But I also think that something else is going on, that there is that this, this kind of mob movement is being fed by human motives that we usually don't talk about, human enjoyment of cruelty, of bloodthirstiness in our species. Uh, it's not, it's, I mean, it's a dark thing to say, and I'm sorry about that. I would like to say that we are all generous and loving, or that we have at least that potential, but we, and we do, but we also have the potential for cruelty. And we see a lot of that today. We see a lot of that in the conflicts in Israel, in the conflicts in the Ukraine. Uh, we have to, so part of our politics has to be an agenda to suppress that. We have to really stamp on that human tendency, but it is part of our nature, I think. And it's part of our nature that we have to be very wary of. Brings us back to civilization and its discontents, maybe. Um, Can you say that again? Oh, I said it brings us back maybe to civilization and its discontents, to Freud. Yeah. yeah. Yes, it does. That's a it's it's a horrible perspective, but I think it's of the recent events have made me feel that it's true. That there is this about us that we have to be wary of. Mm -hmm. Civilization has to be the instrument for stamping it out or at least containing it. So do you, um, so the results on Tuesday were hopeful. There's a lot that's uncertain and a lot that potentially is dark in the future. Um, I mean, what, what can people do? We have students here who are just starting their intellectual and political lives, maybe their artistic lives. Um, and, you know, what is there? I mean, it seems to me, yeah, I, I, how, how do we stand against the tide? How do we stand up to what is darkest, but also keep alive the hope for something better? I think, you know, there's been a feeling a little bit, um, at least I can speak personally, um, kind of 2016 to 2020 was actually in certain ways on the one hand, a very dark time, but also a very hopeful one in certain ways. A lot felt like it was changing in a way that was new and exciting. Um, and there is something about these last few years that's felt a little less like that. So I'm wondering, are there ways we can get back to that, that feeling of um, uh, possibility that is part of motivating people, I think, um, as well as standing up against the worst? And yeah, do you have any thoughts about how people can intervene? Well, the I think the brightest thing on the horizon is the rise of the youth and the possibility that they will have a very, uh, very different, that they will cast a kind of warm and hopeful uh, cloud on our future and that they're this has been true for some time young people are not as racist they are not they are not as hostile to sexual deviance they're not 
as and uh, upset about immigrants, they're much better than we are. And I think that their rise as political actors could improve American politics, but not by themselves. We have to support them. I think that is a good note um, for us to close on. So um, I wanna just thank again, um, our guest, Frances Fox Piven. Um, I am honored to be talking with her. I think these questions about the difference between democratic theory and practice and how we move from one to the other, how we turn a pseudo-democracy in shambles into um, a real opportunity for uh, people to determine the conditions of their lives and make their lives better are just about the most urgent questions there are. So thank you so much, Francis, for joining us. And, thank uh, you. and um, my very brief plug is um, we'll start up this lecture series again in the winter. Um, our next lecture on January 23rd um, of 2024 uh, after the new year will be um, artist Aura Rosenberg, um, who just had recently a big retrospective um, in uh, at the Michigan Gallery and also in Brooklyn and Pioneer Works. Some people might have seen She's former SVA faculty, a very interesting artist, influenced, among others, by Walter Benjamin. Um, and uh, she is giving a talk kind of on her um, her retrospective and the trajectory of her work called What is Psychedelic? So um, please uh, come out to that um, on January 23rd, 2024. Thank you also in the chat, um, some mention about the Belfast Peace Agreement. Um, I 100% agree that those are the <laughs> those are the things we should be thinking about in this moment of war and catastrophe. And speaking of Walter Benjamin, I've been thinking a lot about his image of the angel of history looking on too much wreckage and weeping. Um, uh, and we should we should fight against that. Uh, so again, thank you, Francis. Thanks to everyone for um, a thoughtful conversation this evening. And uh, wishing you all some warmth and a lovely night. Bye-bye.